Hey everybody, I'm Michael Woods, founder of Inclusive Sport Design, and welcome to the Sport is for Everybody podcast, where we talk all things inclusion in sport with amazing guests who are out there making it happen. We are recording on beautiful Gundungurra country, so I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Gundungurra people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also pay my respects and welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and all other Indigenous and First Nations peoples who might be joining us today. Now, if you're new to the podcast, welcome and thank you for being here. Please go ahead and hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can also check out episode zero, which is our preview episode. If you want to learn more about inclusive sport design or you want to learn more about who I am, there'll be a link in the show notes so you can check that out. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to just address one small thing. So for those who have been following along with all of our previous episodes up to now, you might've noticed something a little different about the intro. You might've been wondering why all the marketing for the podcast had one name, but in the episodes I was using something else. Well, basically for the first four episodes, which were all pre-recorded in late 2022, at that time I hadn't really landed on what the name of the podcast was going to be. So I sort of went with the Inclusive Sport Design or the ISD podcast, but come time to publish everything, I had kind of figured out what I wanted to do with this thing. And so we've come up with the name, The Sport is for Everybody podcast. So starting from this episode and into the future, we will be referring to it as The Sport is for Everybody podcast. So just wanted to clear that up in case anyone was wondering. That's the life of a, a newbie podcaster, I guess. We, we don't really know what we're doing until we're doing it. So yeah, hopefully that, that clears it up for you. So this is episode five. And today I'm with Jessica Scannell to learn how she is making inclusion in sport happen for multicultural communities through her work at Welcoming Australia. Now, Jessica is originally from Ireland and she's played basketball at an elite level. She's lived the migrant experience as well in multiple countries. And she now calls Melbourne Australia home. She's experienced firsthand the power sport has to heal and develop a sense of belonging for people from migrant backgrounds and people with disabilities and is determined to create more opportunities for more people to access all the benefits that she's gained through a life of sport. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Let's just get into it. Jessica Scannell, welcome to the Sport Is For Everybody podcast. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for having me. Really great to be here. It's wonderful to have you here too. Before we get started, do you want to let us know what First Nations lands you're on today? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm joining today from Bunurong lands, just south of Melbourne in the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to also pay my respects to, to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations people that, that might be listening in today. Awesome. Thanks for that, Jess. We've got a lot coming up in this chat. We're going to take a deep dive into your work supporting migrant and refugee communities to access sport and you've achieved some amazing outcomes there. So I'm looking forward to digging into that. And also later on in the chat, I'm going to ask you about an emerging area of work that you're really interested in. And it's an area that I've just started to explore as well. And that's trauma-informed practice in sport and in coaching. So listeners and people watching, stick around for that because it's it's going to be an interesting topic to talk about for sure. But there's going to be plenty more than that too. So first off, Jess, I'm super interested in your kind of backstory. So you're originally from Ireland and now you find yourself in Melbourne here in Australia. How did you come to be here? Share your journey with the listeners. Sounds great. Yeah, more than happy to share my story. Just before before I do, I just wanted to say thanks so much to you for doing this. Like, I think it's so important for people to chat to, you know, more of the grassroots sort of inclusion space and people that are really interacting on a day by day basis with people with additional support needs in local clubs and local communities. I think that, you know, that's really where the magic happens. So that's sort of a point of difference with this podcast, I think. So, yeah, thank you for, for what you're doing. I think people can really get a lot out of all of these different stories and experiences and super happy um, to add my middle piece of it, my experience to that. So yeah. Oh, thanks Jess. Um, I really appreciate that. And yeah, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's the goal. We, we want to show people how, how, how things work at the coalface of, of sport and inclusion. So yeah, I'm glad to have your perspective today as well. So yeah, tell us, tell us your story. Yeah, fab. So I grew up in, in Cork, Ireland, was born sort of into, I guess, a basketball family. My dad is a very, well, 
he likes to think he's famous. He's probably famous in Ireland, but 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 not so much in the rest of the world. But definitely in Ireland, he's probably one of the most successful high performance basketball coaches that that the country has kind of seen. And you know, you, you don't really have a reference point for that as a child. You're just born into whatever family you're born into. So for me, as soon as I could walk, I pretty much had a basketball in my hand. I was following my dad around to his various different trainings, but also, you know, making lots of relationships from a really early age with people who were really connected in a sports system that I didn't really understand. I was immersed in it and I I caught the sort of bug really, really early since I was, oh, I reckon five or six. It was my dream to try to get a scholarship to go to America to, to develop my game. And then hopefully to become a professional basketball player. And another really, really big dream of mine was always to enter my country, to play for Ireland at the national level in basketball. And, you know, I was I was really lucky to to kind of have that experience early on and for my sport to always be, you know, whatever I wanted to achieve, to be fostered in my sport. But also I grew up in, in Ireland in a, in a, I suppose, a socioeconomically disadvantaged area. So while... My family had really good sport connections, like I certainly wasn't. It's from a sort of financial point of view, like I didn't go to private school. The high school I went to had really like less than 50% of the students end up going on to, to third level education. So I guess for me, basketball and sport, I just saw as my sort of ticket, like to education, to travel, yeah. to the world. And I just, you know, I, I was privileged in the sense that I was able to latch onto that really easily. But I also feel like I knew I had to, to work hard in order to to sort of achieve what I did. So luckily, yeah, I, I, I thrived, you know, in that in that environment. I played for all of the junior Irish national basketball teams. And then I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go over to the state. So I played NCAA Division One basketball at Iona College for four years. And then I transferred and did my master's at Pace University again in New York. And, you know, for me, sport really has been my ticket to the world. It's provided me with my education, opportunities to travel. Pretty much every every friend I've ever had, I think, has been connected to basketball in one way or another, even my my partner now. Yeah. And so did my five years in the States. And then after that, I played professional in Europe for a year. I'd kind of been away from home at that point for, you know, six years since I was 18 and really wanted to to come back because I did I think you don't realize until you leave how special your community yeah. actually is. And so uh, I did miss that. I missed that sense of belonging and that I had a home. Like uh, when I was in the States and even playing in Europe, you know, your worth as a person is sort of tied to your performance as an athlete. And that wasn't the case for me at home. That was just, you know, who I was and, and what my family sort of was. So I really wanted to come home. But uh, after six months at home, I just, I really missed again playing professionally and wanted a chance to, to come out to Australia. So I got an opportunity come out here and play professionally for the Melbourne Tigers. That was eight years ago now. I'm working now in the inclusive sports space. So that's probably my next question is, is how did you end up in the inclusive sports space? You know, coming from a, you know, elite, elite sports person background and global traveler, how did you land in, in this, this kind of work? Yeah, look, to be honest, again, you know, I just think nobody really is an individual. Nobody is an island. Like we're all shaped by our relationships, by our families, by our culture, by our communities. And again, I was, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but as a child, I was really fortunate actually to grow up with people with disability uh, Mm -hmm. in my family. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, I saw a model for inclusion that was just really normal to me. But looking back, it was very extraordinary, I think, really. So my my grandmother, that's my dad's mom, my Nana Noreen, she's, she's passed away now, but she basically raised me, you know, she was like my second mom and her, her, she, it was actually her, um, her niece, but they sort of grew up as, as sisters it was a, a lady called Mary Morris and Mary had Down syndrome. Uh, And so back then, you know, the, the models for, for how people with disabilities were treated was really sad actually like looking back and really extreme and people were isolated and a lot of the times they were put in institutions and you know my grandmother her mother and her mother's sister who was Mary Morris's mother they just refused to let that happen so yeah. the the result was that Mary was sort of raised as my grandmother's sister and they were always together now she wasn't able to go to mainstream school with my grandmother and her sisters you know unfortunately that's the way it was 
But when they would come home from school, they would teach her everything they learned during the day and play with her and bring her to their activities. Yeah. And even later when she was a, an older woman, she was kind of always with my nan or one of the other sisters. So, you know, she would pick me up from school. We would walk home. She would help me with my homework. And, and I just remembered her as a really beautiful, present person that, you know, I guess I didn't understand, you know, I suppose with her intellectual disability, she didn't have a lot of the other like responsibilities that like an adult in our family would have. So she had a lot of time to hang out with the kids, you know, and to help us and to, to share stories with us. And she sort of did have that, you know, I'm talking about as, you know, 50, 60 year old woman, she sort of did have that kind of inner child like present. Yeah. And, and so for me, that was my reference of what a person with a disability was. And I just loved being around her and I couldn't really understand why, you know, there wasn't more people engaging in community in, in yeah. that way as I grew older and saw that, oh, this isn't actually a normal model, you know? So and would you say that that sort of family experience and background and history and, and, and stuff has kind of, because I know, you know, professionally your background is in speech pathology and audiology and, and language therapy and things like that, right? So do you think, you know, that, that kind of um, background in your family and experience has led you into that and then sort of, you know, that combination of your love of sport and your love of kind of, you know, ensuring an inclusive society and servicing people in that way is kind of how you've landed in the work that you're doing now? Absolutely. You know, sometimes people talk about sort of like space or if something's just like meant to be. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even something I ever had to think about. For me, it was just a very innate sense of like, yeah. this is who I am. You know, I'm really lucky that I have this really great knowledge and connections in high performance space. But I'm also really lucky that I have these amazing relationships with people that, you know, need extra support. And I know that if I can get the skills and experience, I can actually use that model of sport to really help those people to yeah, belong in their communities. Like that was something that was just part of my life, not just with Mary, but also with my other family members. So my, my cousin, now my younger cousin, Shane, he has Down syndrome as well. And then my brother, he was diagnosed with ASD. So, so back then when he was diagnosed, it was still called Asperger's syndrome. So he's like pretty, what, what people used to call sort of high, high functioning, I guess. But he definitely benefited so much from being part of that community sporting space. Yeah. So it was interesting for me when I was studying in university, I was studying speech language pathology and audiology. And my brother's much younger than me. So he was only three years old and he was sort of going through his first experiences of going into, you know, kindergarten and, and, and sort of getting a diagnosis and that journey with my mom. So I was sort of studying this stuff and then my mom and my brother were kind of living it. So it was living just it, really yeah. amazing, like everything kind of coming, coming full circle. And yeah, it just really validated for me that this is, this is what I, what I want to do, you know, and I'm just okay. Yeah. So we'll be doing it now. So let's talk about the work that you're doing and you have such a unique set of experiences. So I'm, I'm so glad that you're in, in the work that you're doing. You're the perfect person. Yeah. But tell us a little bit about Welcoming Australia, who you're working for and the, the initiatives that you're working on briefly, because I want to get into how you go about what you do, not so much, you know, what you do, how you actually do it. So give us a brief skinny on Welcoming Australia and what you're working on. I'll do my best. <laughs> so yeah, Welcoming Australia is a national organization, national not-for-profit organization in Australia. The purpose, the overarching purpose of Welcoming Australia is to advance social cohesion, essentially, to create an Australia where all people from all backgrounds can belong, contribute and thrive in their local communities. It does that in a number of different facets. Essentially, Welcoming Australia focuses much more on what we call the receiving community. So that's the more, the longer established, I guess what people would call Aussie communities and yeah. how those communities can better serve people that are are coming into them, you know, for the first time, or in some cases, maybe are from a migrant or refugee background from a number of generations, but still, you know, are experiencing barriers to to fully participating in community life. So one of the the initiatives is welcoming cities. That's sort of their biggest initiative where they support local councils to advance inclusion in a really targeted needs-based way for for their individual geographic locations. 
Another area that they, that Welcoming Australia seeks to do that is through sport. And that's through the Welcoming Clubs Initiative. And that's that's the initiative that I sort of work on. And that's sort of, again, working with community sports clubs and helping them to actively include and reach out to, I suppose, communities that would have been labelled hard to reach. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that that label, but but that's sort of what, what Welcoming Clubs does big picture. And then really minute within that, I run a program called Welcome to the Game. And so that focuses on supporting young people from refugee and migrant backgrounds who also have disabilities, additional support needs, autism, any sort of additional barriers that make it harder for them to participate in the in the traditional mm-hmm. mainstream sporting sense. And we essentially, again, try to work with those receiving communities, those local clubs and swim centers, and try to help them to build modified programs that really target those, those families because, you know, they're experiencing that intersectionality of having a double barrier. So they're experiencing yeah. all the same barriers that people from refugee and migrant backgrounds are facing. Plus, they have the additional barrier of having those additional support needs or disabilities. And and sometimes they don't always understand them either because of the journey that they've had. They might not have the same education or experience with the healthcare mm-hmm. system and, and things like that. Uh, and we, we might touch a little more on that um, in a, intersectional kind of nature and complexity of the work that you're doing. But... Can you give us a bit of an insight into what do you think ensures success? For me, the biggest thing is the relationships. You know, like we really focus on on building really good, strong, trusting relationships with the families. A lot of the times from our experience, it is the mums. It is quite often sometimes a single mum supporting kids mm. with complex needs. And if we kind of really sit down and and gain their trust, you know, and let them know that we're there for them and their child as their child is, and we want to accept them. And and the issue is more around supporting that swim center that we're running that program with, for example, supporting their teachers and their staff to better understand and adapt to meet the needs of that child, rather than the family thinking, you know, that there's something wrong with their child. Once we sort of gain that trust and they see us as their sort of ally and advocate, then so much of the walls and the barriers come Mm. down and you really see the parents sort of like breathing like a sigh of relief because, you know, every child just wants to belong in their local community settings. And for some of our kids, welcome to the game is the first time they've had the chance to do that outside of their family or, or school life, you know? So I think relationships are key and also we are really big on valuing the expertise of the family and the parents at their lived yeah. experience with their child. And, and essentially we sit down with them and we just ask them, look, you, you know your child best, like what's going to best help them to, to thrive and participate. And then we're sort of just feeding that information back to the, the club or the swim center, but with the sort of expert hat on. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, that same message gets a different reception depending on who is is giving it so we try to be that that link i guess between the the families and the receiving community and you got to have a really solid relationship in order to be able to to do that yeah that process of collecting information and insights from the participant and family that first-hand lived experienced info about their needs is is so important and often, more often than not in mainstream sports settings is not done. Assumptions tend to be made based on, you know, either a personal perspective bias or, or a medicalized approach, particularly when you talk about people with disability to understanding an individual's life experience, you know, you're more than a diagnosis. And you know, we talked about that in episode two with Lisa Drennan in, in great depth around the, the, the necessity of, of asking those questions. Not, not about mm. uh, what are your deficits or challenges. It's, you know, who are you? What do you need? What do you, what do you like? What are your goals? What are your values? Who are you as a person? And how do we facilitate all of that in sport? And the one thing I would say too, is, you know, we're not here to like be super negative and critical of the mainstream sports system. Like I, I, I've been part mm. of that, that high performance space, as you know, and I do recognize that, that clubs and swim centers you know, they are really stretched. They are really understaffed. There is a culture of feeding everyone into that performance pyramid, you know? And so I think rather than being super critical of that, just trying to sort of fold people's hands, I'm talking about the the receiving community here, um, Mm -hmm. and show them a way to do that work, I think is really important. So, So that's why I'm so fortunate with my role is that when we co-deliver a program with a 
with a swim, I keep saying swim center because that's just the most recent program that we've done. Yeah. I, I actually can do that work for them. So I yeah. can connect with the families, build that little profile, help to design the program, help to group the classes and sort of show them, look, this is how we do it. And then our hope is that they see, oh, it's actually, you know what? It's actually not that hard. Like we just need to yeah. put someone dedicated on to this and recognize that not everyone can fit into all of the little you know, tick yeah. boxes that we have and slowly, slowly, hopefully they'll, they'll get better. I don't, I actually don't think it's the case that people don't want people with disabilities in their spaces. I think they just either don't know how to do it or they just don't understand the barriers because they haven't experienced yeah. it themselves. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's very true, particularly, you know, community club land, you know, I, I very rarely have ever come across someone or a club in general who, who has been actively exclusive of people and saying, no, 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 we don't want them. It's, it's, it's a lot to do with, yeah, we want to do it. We'd love to do it all, or we think we're doing it, but we, we don't really know how to go about it. So the, the role that you play in that is, is critical. I think particularly for clubs starting out with this kind of you know, engaging with new audiences. And speaking of new audiences, something we kind of talk about on, have talked about on all of the episodes so far is this idea of how do we actually connect with those target audiences, whether it be multicultural, whether it disability or, you know, you know, whatever audience you, you might want to look at, how do you connect with them and, and how do you understand their needs and wants? So you talked a little bit about asking them questions, but how do you, how do you, how do you connect with them in the first place? So they know that you've got an offering that that's for them. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we do that in lots of ways because, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's an individual and everyone yeah. comes to a setting with their own sort of level of needs and how comfortable they are with identifying with their disability. So we do run programs that are advertised as inclusive programs in, in areas where we know there's lots of diversity, where we know there's lots of socioeconomic disadvantage as well. And we do get, you know, families that are comfortable with signing up to those programs and uh, 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 putting in an expression of interest and then we contact them. But we also know that that model is not going to be accessible for everyone, especially if they might be a newly arrived family or they don't identify with the term disability. And we know that like for those families and those communities, they're going to feel safest and most comfortable with the, the cultural community that they feel like they sort of belong with, belong to. And so in those instances, it's so important that we deliver co what we call co-delivered community events with specific communities where we know there's a lot of people who are from refugee backgrounds. Mm. So what we'll do is we'll help. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. We work a lot with, with CoHealth. CoHealth are an amazing community health organization here in Melbourne, and they have their bicultural worker program. And essentially what that is, is there's sort of community leaders from a lot of the refugee communities across Melbourne, whose role is to connect their own community in with the, the health services and also healthy lifestyle, sort of that mm. co-health promote. And so part of that is a lot of the bicultural workers, they get opportunities to run um, healthy lifestyle events for their own community. And most of the time they want to, they want to put on a sporting event. Like that's yeah. what all the kids love to do. So we try to tap in with that. So just last year, we supported one of the bicultural workers at co-health to deliver the East African Community Basketball Fund Day. And so that wasn't actually promoted as a disability inclusive event. It was for everyone. It was for all of the families from, you know, those, those larger East African sort of backgrounds in the, in the Western suburbs. But part of that, what, what we said is, look, you know, we know you want to deliver a, a healthy, you know, fun basketball day for all of the community, but our funding is tied to that disability inclusion. So if we're going to come together and deliver this event, we need to make sure that there is an all abilities inclusive session that is for kids with additional needs. That's part of that day. Yeah. So we had sort of the, the more mainstream pathway on the day. And then we also had the all ability session, which was just for an hour right in the middle of the day. But it was so beautiful because we were able to get those young people that, that love sport, that are from cultural, the, the multicultural communities, come in and help us out with coaching. So they yeah, learned yeah. a lot about like the modification and how a disability inclusive session worked. But then we also had all of the, the kids that are, you know, family members and, and brothers and sisters and cousins of, of the kids that were playing the, the more competitive side that normally wouldn't get a chance to actually join in and sport at a cultural community event. And all of a sudden there was an event just for them, part of this larger community day 
and and they feel really comfortable, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, you know, their older brother that's helping to coach them and their siblings are joining in with them and they're in a cultural sort of setting where they're not. They sort of odd one out. And, and you know, there was one mom that said to me, her, she had two little girls that are that were deaf. And she said, you know, this is the first time they'd ever done any sport because yeah. they don't like they don't, I guess, identify with the traditional like deaf community here in Melbourne, which is which is an amazing community and be, has been, you know, doing great stuff for a long time. But what I saw, what I really wanted the that day and the other sort of code liver community event days we have is that's sort of a first step, right? Where they can participate yeah. in, in a sporting session in a really, really safe environment. And then from there, I can say, you know, we actually have this program called Welcome to the Game where we could link you to modified sporting opportunities that are that are really suited to your needs, you know, and you know, we can help you with that if you want. And 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 they've sort of developed that that trust with us first and foremost. Yeah. No, absolutely. And and I think that that program or that, that that event is 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 such a good example of how you can kind of address and, and cater for the the I don't want to use the word complex, but the multifaceted needs and 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 unique needs of of a of a community of people that that you know do have particular cultural background and ethnic connections and community, but also have disability and bringing those things together. the The other couple of things that stood out for me in that was the importance of partnerships and working collaboratively, co creating, co delivering, and and also being able to have those, I guess, conversations about well, what are our mutual goals here and, and bringing those together and coming up with a solution that, that meets the needs of both organizations or all organizations that are involved. And when you get that right, you get the sorts of things that you've just described where you get these really meaningful and, and well-received types of activities and engagements that people don't usually get access to. And, and the other thing as well was, you know, you mentioned that you sort of see some of these types of programs as like a and into the sport system and the sport pathway as a, as a taster, as a, as a first step towards more options. And then using that as a platform to then link them and connect them to other opportunities and programs and pathways that, that might exist. And I think those two things are critical to effective sport program delivery. And so I want to jump to, I guess, how, and you touched on it a little bit, but how do you determine what the actual activities look like for participants in terms of the game they play or the, the, the tasks that they do or the sports that they get involved in. How do you, how do you go about that? And, and in that, how do you incorporate those adaptations and modifications that meets the needs of those participants? That's a great question, Michael. I think a lot of people really want to know about the nuts and bolts about how to actually do it. And the short answer is that it really does vary depending on the group you're working with and the sport you're working in. But I suppose the best way to do it is to kind of, to explain this, is to kind of give you a few examples of the, of, of some of the different work that we do. Yeah, so great. being a, being a basketball person myself, basketball is something I'm really passionate about. And with basketball, and I know with some of the other really big sporting organizations, they do have that learned play curriculum. So in basketball, it's Aussie hoops. I know there's a blasters program and cricket there's a, a lot of other like really great curriculum that focuses on that games-based model and game sense approach so mm -hmm. we really try to use that a, a, as the baseline because we know you know that's that's what kids want to be able to do right all the same things as as all the other kids who are learning how to play for the first time do but the, the reality is that we might have a young person who has an intellectual disability who's you know 15 and is going to have the same sort of cognitive capacity and physical capacity as someone who's, you know, doesn't have a disability and who's seven and who's starting yeah. this war for the first time. And so I think that like traditionally we have this idea that based on someone's chronological age, they should be, you know, performing like complex tactical plays and stuff like that. And and we just say, look, just make the intention and the whole purpose of the session um to to be that those those kids are moving. They're making mm. friends, they're having fun, and then they're also having opportunities to learn new skills at their own pace within the context of that session. Like, don't coach the kids according to where you think they should be at based on their age or something like that. Coach them on where they're actually at and what they're going to enjoy 
And so I find that, and this is just, this isn't even like inclusive coaching. This is just general principles of Mm -hmm. good modern coaching that instead of having, you know, everyone having to wait in a line and, and perform a particular action that you've like prescribed and then ranging their performance of that, like based on like your idea of what it should look like, just get rid of all of that, you know, make the, the activities be a game where people have to, you know, work together to get a certain number of goals in the hoop or, or, or capture a certain number of flags and then make sure that there is opportunities, one, for everyone to have a ball and for everyone to be participating at the same time, reduce the amount of time where people need to stand still and wait as much yeah. as possible. And then also within that have different options. So, for example, when I do, when we do our warm up with the basketball sessions, we'll say, you have a choice. You can do high knees running here. You can get your knees up and you can run as high as you can, or you can just walk and touch your knee to your hand. It's up to you which exercise you choose or somewhere in the middle of that, you do whatever works for you. And then using kids like and, and the people that are supporting them, they're just happy to be able to do to do something that and to be supported and to be encouraged. So those are those are some really important yeah. strategies. And then the other thing is predictability. So yeah. we try to be really clear on having a fixed lesson plan. And it doesn't mean that the same activities have to happen every single week because like everyone, people are going to get going to get bored of that pretty quickly. But it's around, you know, we start every session in a circle and everyone gets a chance to say how they're feeling and introduce themselves. We, we do a fundamental movement, physical literacy focused warm up where we don't use any basketballs because that's just allowing people to land in space, regulate their, not just their bodies, but also their minds and get ready for learning. And then we sort of have games that are skill building activity. And then we always finish off with a modified version of a, of a full sort of game. And so the kids know like what's going to happen each session. And then with those skill building activities, when we circle up, we will say, okay, today our games are going to focus around dribbling. And that's the skill we're focusing on today. And so we sort of prep people into what they're going to be, what they're going to be learning. That's all amazing advice. And I think sometimes sport providers and coaches sometimes get caught up in the whole, well, this is what soccer looks like. So this is how we deliver soccer. Oh, this is what the rules are. So this is how we deliver soccer or, you know, tennis or, you know, insert sport here. Right. And, and so instead of actually starting at the point of, okay, well, who, who are my participants today? What are our goals for these participants and what do they want to get out of it? And starting from that point and, mm. you know, yeah, build to the full version of whatever sport it is. You know, swimming doesn't have to look like up and down a 50 meter lane every session, especially for kids, especially for a diverse group of kids, regardless of who's there. You know, you want to give kids something different to participate in. But like you say, with that structure, so that there's predictability and safety in that. And so they know what they're in for every week. I think it's super important and amazing advice. And we'll touch on why that might be important when we talk about trauma-informed practice in a moment, because some of that is is highly relatable. But before we jump into that, I want to ask about funding and resources for the work that you do and kind of particularly as that middle organization between a target audience and you know mainstream sport providers or the receiving community as you call it how is, how is your activity funded and sustained because i'm sure that that must be a challenge yeah it is going to be a challenge at the moment we're we're very lucky we're funded we were originally funded by the ndia so they had a massive red so that's funding. the national disability insurance agency here in australia it's a federal insurance scheme that's right and and it has two originally in its original design it had sort of two streams so there was the ndis which was the national disability insurance scheme which is people's individualized support plans and they can use that funding that they receive to access you know whatever supports they need in the Mm -hmm. community but then there was another stream of the ndia model, which was called the ILC, which was information linkages and capacity building. And essentially that was a whole heap of funding and projects that were designed to build the capacity of the mainstream community to better include and welcome 
people with disabilities into their services. And so we were funded by that and our and our sort of motto or our our goal or our mandate was to support local mainstream sport providers to to better include our target cohort, which is that welcome to the game target cohort. But I think what has happened is that side, that ILC side of the NDIA has gotten sort of too too big, I guess, to manage with so many people getting individualized plans now. So that funding has actually moved over to being managed by the Department of Social Services now. So where we still have another 12 months of funding under that ILC program. And essentially that gives us the funding to, you know, for my role to support our resource resources and then for me to go in and and build the capacity of providers, start up a co-delivered program and then that initial kickstart funding. So usually it's about a term long for participants to get started with a program at that local community, we can we can pay for them to remove that cost barrier. But then after that sort of initial, you know, kickstart period is over, yeah, we do have to work with either the clubs to help them to look at a funding model for their inclusion program. Because we essentially want to set it up and then give it to them and say, okay, like you have these great kids, you know how to run the program now, like keep it going. So there's different ways that they can fund that. And then also some participants are actually eligible to fund um access to social and community participation through their NDIS plans. It's very yeah. individualized and, and we don't really get into that individualized side of it because that's not what we're funded to do. But we do try to support that choice and control. And we have had some families that after our initial kickstart program took place, it sort of gave them the motivation and the inspiration to go back and get some of that community participation funding into their NDIS plan. But it's very individual. So yeah, yeah. it's the sustainability piece is hard. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, so I want to take a little sidestep now and, and talk about this sort of emerging area of work that I know you're really passionate about and have spent a lot of time learning about, and I'm just starting to discover it and, and learn about it as well. And that is trauma-informed practice in sport and in coaching as well. And some of our listeners may not have heard of that phrase before they might not know what that is so do you want to just give a really brief sort of you know what what is trauma-informed practice and how does it kind of fit in the I guess the inclusive sports space you know what why is it important thanks so much for that question Michael yeah I think it's a really really important space especially dealing with the communities that we work with where people are from you know refugee backgrounds Inherently, if you really think about someone's journey as a refugee, there is going to be some trauma in there a lot of the time. You know, people are, are fleeing, you know, terrible situations, war, persecution, things like that. And and that doesn't just go away once you're physically safe. Like the, yeah. the effects of that can linger for generations, you know. And then also the other part of it is that it's not just that 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 big sort of trauma that is easier for us to sort of, I guess, understand, like the idea of a natural disaster or a war or something like that. There is this idea of of complex trauma, so ongoing trauma or chronic stress that people can experience. And again, here in Australia, there is is historically huge amounts of of systemic racism and, and social isolation and exclusion and socioeconomic disadvantage and, you know, family violence and things like that, it can really play on how a person um, functions in the world. Like anyone, if you're dealing with so much of this chronic stress, how you perceive the world, how you interact with the world is going to be different than someone who is being raised in a really calm, sort of privileged environment where they have lots of connections and support and sort of all of their basic needs being met. And then what we see is that you have families that have experienced that big trauma that you know like a war persecution they've come here to australia and then they're experiencing that Mm. sort of more ongoing chronic stress because of socioeconomic disadvantage racism in some cases and just kind of really gets uh too much for people you know and then if if again if the receiving communities don't understand all of that the child comes in to, to participate and they just get labeled as the bad kid or the angry kid or the kid who wants to, to fight, you know, and we just need to, we just need to bridge that gap of understanding because going back to the whole trauma informed sport is a uh, piece is that sport, if it's delivered well, it's actually inherently good for helping people to heal 
from yeah. that trauma and to support, you know, the, the regulation of their stress responses and things like that. So I guess I should just backtrack a little bit. I've just done a certification in, in this over the last yeah. 12 months called the Neurosequential Model for Sport. And that's led by Dr. Bruce Perry, who's a world leading psychiatrist, childhood trauma specialist and, and neuroscientist. So he's brought his NM model that he's used in therapeutics and the medical field and education for a long time, just recently now into the sport world. And he really believes that if everyone who works with kids in the sporting space knows about this stuff, then those environments are going to be really good places for, for kids to, to heal. And so he's partnered with the Center for Healing and Justice Through Sport, which is an organization in the States to really roll this stuff out to sort of coaches who maybe don't know anything about the brain or science, but, but, but they're really well placed to support this healing. And yeah. so, so what Dr. Bruce Perry's model sort of says and the CJHS model says is that in order to develop resilience and to heal, every child needs access to, to three things. So they need access to really good relationships. So people that you know, care about them, support them, are positive with them. They need opportunities to move their bodies every day. So to engage yeah. in rhythmic, repetitive movement, and which help to, to regulate their nervous system and open up their, their cortex and for learning and thinking and all of that. And they also need to engage in, in stress. And, and that is, I think some people sort of are like surprised by that. Like they hear, they think that, you know, if a child has experienced trauma, that you need to like wrap them up in cotton wool and, and, and make sure nothing bad ever happens to them again. But the, you know, the reality is nobody can do that. And so what they're saying is that it's not about that the children shouldn't have any stress. It's about the type of stress that they're experiencing. Yeah, so right. we want them to experience predictable, moderate, controllable stress that they have an active part in. And so then when they mm. can overcome those predictable, moderate, controllable challenges, they feel a really big sense of self-achievement and pride. And, and if, they, if kids can experience th those three things, so moderate stress, really good relationships, and an opportunity to move their bodies on a regular basis, that's going to really support healing and, and, and you know, really positive yeah. youth development and, and ultimately thriving kids. And so for me, sport is pretty much the only thing I know it's, that if it's delivered it's, well, it, it can it, give you all three of those things. <laughs> It you know? gives you all of those and and more. I yeah, I'm I'm starting to dig into it, starting to do some learning in the space alongside yourself and, and a whole bunch of other people from around the world. And I'm just at the start of that learning at the time of this recording anyway. So what I'm what I'm hoping is to try and bring some of that into the work that we do at Inclusive Sport Design and 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 bring some of that information and share that wider as well. And certainly, you know, we don't have time to get into the the details and, and the the important the important information around trauma informed practice in sport and coaching, but there's a little taster there, everybody. And yeah, we'll pop pop the links to all of those organisations and people and programs that Jess has just mentioned in the show notes, so you can check it out as well. Because I think it's it's going to become an increasingly important part of our practice as people who work in the diversity and inclusion space and with diverse audiences who who have that lived trauma. But I think just as a baseline skill set for coaches and for practitioners in sport in general. I think it's going to become a really, really important, if not essential skill set for people to to have. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jess. I really appreciate it. And, and well done on the, all the work and learning that you've done on it today as well. So we've... No problem at all. And if I just had a second just to add just one little thing around yeah, go. that thing, is that, you know, we, again, just going back, like I really, I, sometimes I feel for the mainstream sport coach who is just like, I need to be, you know, a, a counselor. I need to do disability inclusion. <laughs> I need to know about mental health. I need to be an anti-racism advocate, and LGBT. Child safety. Plus. Yeah. You know, it's just, it never is. And so I guess for me, what I would say is that actually this trauma-informed lens and learning more about that will make all of those things easier for you because one of the facilitators at CJHS explained this to me and it was like a little golden nugget or light bulb went off in my head. Like she said that with all of these spaces around inclusion and exclusion and all of that, if you actually put the person and more specifically than that, the brain and how all of our brains develop and what our brains need in order to feel safe and secure and thrive, if you actually understand the science around that and then you can use strategies for inclusion, you're actually going to 
being sort of ticking all of those boxes just in one sort of area. So that that was like really, really helpful for me. And the other part of it is that, yes, these strategies, if you learn more about them, they will help kids that have experienced trauma or chronic stress, but they're actually just good for everybody. They're actually just good for yeah. everybody to develop a yes. sense of belonging and safety and fun. So it's not like you just only do that for someone you know maybe has experienced something really hard. You actually promote that culture in everything you do. So I guess that's yeah. a nudge in that direction. If anyone's like, oh my gosh, I need to learn about another another thing. It's it's not that. It's it's not really no, like does that make sense? I, I can totally agree. And I think I could see this framework or this way of this way of working becoming really central to you practice as a coach as a as a sports practitioner because it does put the person at the center like you say and that's mm. key and especially for from an inclusion perspective it's wonderful stuff i'm really i'm really looking forward to learning more myself as as we go forward so but well, we're coming to the end and so as always we try to have our quick fire questions with all of our guests so are you ready to jump into some of those yeah absolutely awesome all right first one who's your favorite athlete This is a bit of a cliche. Steph Curry. Oh, yeah. Tell us why. Oh, I just, I love a little guy. I love an underdog. I love the fact that he, you know, doesn't really have the body of a, or or the athleticism of an NBA player, but he's just literally changed the game by working so hard on this amazing skill. And the way he played at the beginning, you know, it wasn't normal. It wasn't status quo quo a lot of people said he ruined the game and now all of a sudden it's emulating him and yeah, yeah. i like to be a bit of a trailblazer so i, I think it's pretty cool what he's done yeah yeah definitely and a big influence in in basketball for sure so what about a team who's your favorite team oh such a hard one my favorite team at the moment is the australian women's national basketball team the open mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. just being so amazed by Lauren Jackson's comeback like it's so like after retiring for so long and then coming back and and winning a bronze medal at the world championship on home soil yeah and also a couple of my teammates who I play with sorry not a couple just just the one who I play with at NBL one level with Geelong Supercats she she was on the team Sarah Blitzav so it was just so cool to see someone that you you know you 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 sort of personally invested in like achieving amazing things on that level so yeah they're definitely my team of the season at the moment yeah and another one of australia's world leading world beating women's sport teams absolutely what about you You, you've mentioned some of your sporting kind of achievements over the years but what's your what's your greatest sporting achievement and maybe it's on the court maybe it's off the court i don't know yeah, I would say still, maybe it's a bit nostalgia, but my, I think my greatest sporting achievement is, is being the captain of the Irish national basketball team at, when I was under 18 at the yep. European Championships. Just that sort of like level of pride in your country and your sort of family and then being chosen and recognized by your peers as kind of a leader at such a young age. It was a really, really formative moment for me. So yeah, something I'll never forget. Yeah, sure. Congratulations. It's a, it's a, it's a big achievement, particularly at that age. So well done. All right. A little bit more about you. What's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Well, at the moment, I'm dog sitting for a friend's toy poodle. So we, I've been getting up and going for an early morning walk with him, which is not something that I've normally had in my routine. And it's Good. been really, really great just to get out, move the body, go for a, a, where I live. There's some really beautiful dog parks, which I wouldn't usually visit when I don't have a dog. And yep. so it's been really nice. It's something I want to keep in my routine, actually, even when the little guy goes back. Good. Good. Bit of movement in the morning. Love it. All right. Last one. The most important one. And I know you shared a huge amount of insights and value for our listeners already, but what is your best inclusion tip? Can I have two? <laughs> you can have two. They're kind of connected. So one is to be really intentional. Be really intentional about what you're actually doing and what is the purpose of it. So with Welcome to the Game, the purpose of our program is for kids to move their bodies, to make friends, and to feel a sense of belonging in whatever local club they're participating in. That's it. We don't care how good they get at the sport. Sometimes they get really good from it. Sometimes they don't. That doesn't bother us. So I think you have to be really intentional about what is the purpose of my program, number one. And number two, 
when you do that, you have to value above all else the lived experience of the family and the child as expertise and be guided by that because people know what's best for them and we need to honor their agency, their choice and control rather than trying to decide what what we think is, is best. Yeah, golden tips there. I think spot on being intentional and, and kind of setting the parameters of, of the goals of your activity and your programs is, is really important. Otherwise, they wouldn't know why they're there and you don't know why you're there and, and, you, and things can get derailed, right? And being intentional in that work is really important. And yeah, I, I couldn't agree more about putting the, the lived experience and, and value, valuing the education and experience of the people that you're actually working with at the center of it. I think that's key. And that, you know, I think all of our, all of our guests so far have said something along those lines one way or another as, mm. as being really important. So if you're new to inclusion, you're new to the podcast, take that, take that note down because it's, it's an essential piece of advice for you. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you for those quick fire answers. Now, before we wrap it up. I did just want to really quickly share with our listeners and, and anyone who's watching as well, a really great tool that we use here at Inclusive Sport Design, which I hope maybe can help you in your inclusion efforts as well. One of the things that I aim to do with this podcast and with all the media content that we try to create and put out in the world is to ensure that it is, of course, as accessible as we possibly can make it. So I mean, just given your professional background, how important are things like, you know, captions and transcripts for, for video content and things? Who do they help? Oh, so, so important. Like, I think they help, you know, they help everyone really in so many ways. I love that. Like, it's kind of become really normalized now, especially with Netflix. You can just turn on the, the closed captioning. Like, I use it even like I don't have a disability and I speak English as a first language, but it sometimes just helps, especially with the some of the Australian action going around on TV, you know. Absolutely. Um, That's spot so on. I think a lot of people think of it as people who are, you know, visually impaired might, might visually or hearing impaired might use different captions for different reasons. But it's also people who might have a language barrier. It's also people who might have sensory sensitivities or ADHD or things like yeah. that. It just helps for communication to be clearer and yeah. for you to be able to kind of have a bit of a sense of what's what's coming rather than having to always like listen through absolutely and i guess so if you're watching at home on youtube then you probably notice that we've got some nifty little captions running across the bottom or maybe you're reading along with the transcripts in our show notes or maybe you're watching and reading along with the live transcript version as well and maybe you've also seen some of our social media videos that have been putting out recently on our various channels. Well, I wanted to let you know about the tool that we use for all of that work and it's called Descript. This software uses AI to automatically generate transcripts so you don't have to do it by hand or pay someone else to do it. And it also will create those captions for you at the click of a button based on that transcript. One of the other cool things it does is you could even create an AI voice that sounds just like yours. So for voiceovers with a really cool tool they, call, they have called overdub but more than that it's it's the tool we use to edit the podcast do all our video and audio editing as well so it's all built into that we use it for our social media content and for our content that we put into our courses and things like that as well now this episode is not sponsored by descript but inclusive sport design is an affiliate partner of descript so if you think this tool could be useful to you if you want to create transcripts on your content or captions on your content then please check out the link in the show notes. It is an affiliate link. So if you do go through and you make a purchase, we earn a small commission at no extra cost to you. But, you know, if you do, thank you very much. It, you know, helps us to continue to make inclusion happen through the podcast and the other work that we do. So please check out Descript if you think it would be useful for you. I appreciate you if you do. Now, that's it. Thanks so much for joining me on the Sport is for Everybody podcast today. Jessica, how can people get in touch with you, find out and connect what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much again for having me, Michael. Really, really enjoyable chat and it's given me things to even reflect on and try to, you know, continue to work on and improve on. If you want to find out more about Welcoming Australia, just check out welcoming.org.au and you can go into the Welcoming Clubs page, which has contact details for me and a bit more information around our Welcome to the Game project. And I'm also going to be involved this year playing basketball with the Long Supercats and the NBL One, which is sort of the off season of the WNBL and NBL. So if you want to come down to Supercats game, check me out on their Instagram and yeah, it's going to be a fun year. Love it. Get down there, buy a ticket, support women's sports, support local sport. 
Definitely. For our listeners, be sure to head over to inclusivesportdesign.com for more resources to help you take action on inclusion. You can also join the ISD community as well as subscribe to our mailing list for free weekly inclusion tip. They go out weekly. And as usual, all the links to everything we've spoken about, everything we've mentioned, as well as the transcript of the show will be available in the show notes. And make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Jessica Scannell. Let me say that again. That was weird. Jessica Scannell. Thanks for making inclusion happen. I appreciate you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.